Welcome to the With You Rugby Podcast, designed to give you an in-depth look at the United States Rugby Foundation, including our grant programs and recipients, fundraisers, events, and much more. Now let's get started. Hello, everyone. I'm Brian Vizard, President of the United States Rugby Foundation. And as we get closer to our 2022 U.S. Rugby Hall of Fame induction ceremony presented by the Rugby Town National Training Center, we thought it'd be a good idea to get to know this year's inductees and special award recipients just a little bit better. And today we welcome in longtime referee and administrator, Mr. Steve Cohen. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Brian. Hey, Steve, where are you joining us from today? I love the background. Oh, uh, from my, for my uh, beautiful home in Medford, New Jersey. You know, it's which is you know, it's basically full of uh, rugby and other and memorabilia. A lot of photos of uh, people, uh, friends I've made over the years, yeah, and books I and books I've never read because I was always too busy <laughs> doing rugby work. Yeah, well, maybe one of the days in the future you can do that. Yeah, soon I hope. Hey, Steve, as we do with all our uh, honorees, we get to know them a little bit better. So tell us about where you grew up and what sports you played as a kid. Um. Some, some some will question whether I've really grown up, but um, I, my my early years were spent from I started born in 1949, and I grew up in 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 the Lower East Side of uh, New York City in Manhattan, um, and I stayed there till I was about nine years old, and then moved to Long Island City in Queens. And uh, what sports you play growing up? Oh, um, no, the no, normal the city uh, c- city concrete sports, which include uh, punch ball, uh, stick ball, handball. I, I, I played in a police athletic league for basketball. I played uh, Pop Warner football. Um, and one thing that we didn't, didn't have initially was baseball, but my father interestingly started the, uh, you know, the uh, story of Little League. And Little Island City and Astoria are, are, are basically a, a, a adjacent to each other. And he and my, he started as president, my mom is treasurer. And, um, and, he also became president of our co-op housing and and he, through his um leadership and he really taught me the value of uh vo- you know volunteering and, you know and, and doing for others and, and selflessness and it would you know and and that's really helped me guided me as with my mother my mother was a bookkeeper very detail oriented you know attention to all the little things and that also helped me uh you know serve me well over the years sure now how did you get involved with rugby um, that was interesting. I was uh, working. I went to school at Rensselaer, RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York, in 1966. Uh, in the, uh, I was working there yeah, in the summers. I was working as an engineering trainee at General Electric in Schenectady in the large steam turbine uh, generator department. And I wound up, uh, interestingly, um, reading a Schenectady GE News, and there was this little article saying, Schenectady Rugby Football Club being formed, uh, come out to practice at this park, da, 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 this, you know, on these days. And I knew three of the words. Uh, were obvious, you can guess the word I didn't know, I never heard of, it was rugby, you know. And not, and this again, 1969, so where do you look it up? Well, n- nowhere. So I went out, and what it was was a bunch of uh, uh, Brits, mostly pretty much English, all English and Irish guys, but one other American. And you know, I started le- learning the game. And what happened with GE at General Electric? A lot of companies in the late '60s there was a shortage of engineers, and they hired a number of uh, you know British engineers, and that's what, what these guys were. And they, that, that's how that's got me going. I was the youngest kid on the team, but just over 19, and and they were all a bit older so it was it was just a, a lot of fun a great experience and uh, it taught it taught me over the, ne- over the next five six years one of the most important things that we should never forget about rugby that it, it should always be fun mm-hmm. i agree with that now we, we talked at the beginning here a little bit about your refereeing and administrating how'd you get into refereeing um <laughs> you're probably like most people but by bitching at, at referees and you know say you're just complaining uh, I didn't actually do it too often. One time we were playing, we went down all the way down to Penn State, and the referee I thought w- w- was was awful. Well, he was awful. I didn't think he was awful, but and I told him so, and and he and he said the right thing to me. He says, "You think you could do better? You do it." And so w- when I got the opportunity to do it, I could not do better initially, but I and I learned, you know, and and you know, and, and that's really got me going. And I saw the need, and I started enjoying refereeing. And, so I would referee some games and I would play, you know, I'd, I'd play, if I played A side, I'd referee B side and, and vice versa. You know, that's, you know, I did that 
you know, from until 1976 in Schenectady. Then I moved to Ann Arbor, you know, and did it in Michigan. Well, let's talk about that move to Ann Arbor. Um, you and I go way back. I mean, you were referencing some of my games. I started in 1978 in Michigan. What yeah. brought you to the great state of Michigan? And what were some of your fondest memories from your days there? Oh, I, I'd say the, um, what brought me was uh, I had really kind of reached my, I uh, call it engineering uh, limit you know, working with GE in terms of what I was trying to accomplish in my career. And Beck, I got a job at Bechtel Power Corporation in Ann Arbor to help help build, at that time, the Midland Power Plant. And uh, it wound up uh, getting the opportunity to expand my, you know, my engineering experience, and, you know, from, from just steam turbines into uh, power plants. And uh, and that's that really really got me going. And the first thing I did when I got before I got there was was to get a contact with with the, the club in town, which is the University of Michigan. And, and 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 at that time, if you, if you remember, college teams were basically pretty wide open. They were they were they were regular players from town, and as well as as well as students. And so I got a chance to you know to join the team. And I played with them regularly for for a year, but also refereed again. Like I said, with Schenectady, I would. I played A side of referee B or, or vice versa. And so then in 77, I decided my future at, in rugby was better served as a referee than, than a player because I was getting some shoulder injuries at my was ankle injuries. And, and I went into, I went into just into playing and probably my, some of my f f best moments, you know, there are many um, is um, I, I did something very unique as a referee. Uh, I refereed a lot of the Michigan home games and, um, after the home games, someone would always throw a big party. And I used to throw, as a referee, I would throw a lot of, I had a house out in Ypsilanti out in the country, nice big house, big rent house with a basement. And I, and I, I would host the parties, which was kind of unique for the ref referee to do. Yeah. And the other thing I'm really proud of in, in, in the early eighties, I, I met some, some girls uh, who were students at the university of Michigan who, who talked to me about trying to help start a team. So I my I helped start the University of Michigan women's team myself and another Michigan player Greg Rose we became the first coaches, and I and helped helped get that get that off the ground. So those are two of the things I'm really I have very really strong fond memories of from my Ann Arbor days. Yeah, and you know we're going to talk about your refereeing in a bit here. But uh, what other rugby clubs you play for besides Michigan? Uh, well, obviously, obviously you know Schenectady for you know for se for, for se seven years and that. That really, what that really was my the heart of my career. Then, 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 then Michigan, and the, and even during the summers with uh, Michigan, as I, you may know, used to used to put together kind of a, a mixed bag of team with some other players and playing some summer tournaments, mm -hmm. you know. And that and actually in that summer of '77, and we played in the last rites of spring tournament. You may remember that sure. Battle Creek used to host, and, and and we won. It was the best, actually, probably the best I ever played with with, with 14 other 15 players. Which for some of the audience, I'm sure you don't, you don't, you don't know that rugby was once played with only 15 players, and if, you, if someone couldn't play anymore, you were down to 14, and uh, so and it was a great weekend. And then a few weeks later, I was going up to Traverse City, as you recall, uh, the, the Cherry Pit tournament, and um, I was going playing with playing with the Michigan team, and and I was also asked to referee. But when I got there, they had myself and one other play, uh, person was the only only referees quote unquote so i wound up not playing and referee the whole you know many more games than probably should have but did that and that really helped also inspired me just to start refereeing full time yeah i'm sure there are some tales uh, you can tell from your long history with the mars team yeah is there yeah. a tale or two that stand out for you oh sure the yeah, mars was the middle-aged rugby side which so it sort of started, I think, in, before it became a Golden Oldies team, which started in 85, be, there was a tour in their mid-80s by Mars, the Mid-Atlantic rugby side. But some people might remember, there was a, which took two full sides over, over to Britain and played there. And then if, when Golden Oldies started in 85, the Mars, you know, Mars became the middle-aged rugby side and over 35s. And in 87, I joined and, and, and we went to Auckland, New Zealand. And there, there was probably one of the greatest memories ever. It and is that our second match was scheduled against the Silver Ferns, and lo and behold, that was the All Blacks. 
you know, they're over 35 side. And believe me, maybe when they were, they were over seven, they were all over 70, we might've been able to kind of keep yeah. up with them. But it, it were, they, and, and they were just, it was just a phenomenal experience. And to, to me, probably the, the big, biggest thing that was in the line out where I was, I first line out also, I looked across from me and there was the great Andy Hayden and I figured I would just kind of, this is for fun, right? I just give him a forearm, push him out of the way. And, and I gave him a forearm and it was like hit, hitting, a, hitting a concrete wall. <laughs> and he kind of looked at me like, what are you kidding? You know, <laughs> and, and, that, and, that, and, that, and, and, and then afterwards, the socializing with these guys and also talking about the great match. A lot of them had played in that great match, you know, almost 10 years earlier. And right. learning about that game from the inside was just a phenom phenomenal experience. And the other, the other great memory, memory i had was in 2008 in edinburgh scotland where i had all about 2001 i started mixing refereeing i, I was a mat became manager of mars playing and also refereeing and in 2008 refereeing in edinburgh the edinburgh golden all these uh on the last day the referee manager the fields we, we, we were i was going we were playing at some of them were right next to murray field stadium which you know the, which is the home field of the scottish national team and they he asked me if i would mind refereeing a women's all-star game which would be inside the stadium and <laughs> of course i just smiled and said yes <laughs> so i wound up doing this chair as a wooden spoon charity i wound up doing a charity match you know, inside Murray Field Stadium, which was which was 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 a real treat. You know, with 80,000 80, seats, uh, albeit all empty, right, but it, right. was, it, 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 it was it was great. Especially my first whistle, where the, the the sound reverberated and echoed back. And about three four seconds later, you hear not only the whistle, but you hear my call the right. second time. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Now, Steve, you're always on the forefront of always trying to make the game safer. Tell us about some of the publications uh, you you wrote in this area um one of the things I, I i noticed especially when i when i, I moved to uh from michigan out to out to southern new jersey the philadelphia area which which happened happened in uh 1984 was there didn't seem to be a lot of attention toward toward safety and understanding i started i started seeing seeing players get, get hurt a bit and also get, get get concussed and there was no there was no medical there was nobody who had any medical real knowledge and no there was no me professional medical people there so i started looking into that and and i made connections with a number of, of called met rugby medical people around the country and also a, a fellow named dick bukowski who was was, was renowned uh, was a rugby guy but he was he was he's renowned as as a sports safety for all sports sa safety expert and and we started putting together some rugby doc, you know uh, documents one was first called safety precaution recommendations then i did the 1998 and making rugby safer which became uh, a few years later uh, the safer rugby program and so i was at the forefront in doing that with with medical you know you know safety professionals and you know it allowed me to use my skills as an organizer in, in, in putting that out and a lot of the unions around the country adopted them as their own and eventually USA Rugby got, as you know, more involved, more involved in it. And you had a role with USA Rugby. You're on their collegiate committee from 1997 to 2004. What was the group's yeah. role, and what was your role specifically within that committee? Um, the, the 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 group's role was really just to, to over, oversee all all of college r rugby, and you know, and, and really, you know, to you know, find find ways to help help it help it grow and develop and one of one of the ways that that in my, my role was i was on competitions committee i also did work on the eligibility committee but the one of the things that that, that i that i i really pushed in, in 19 five years earlier when i or six years early 1991 when i was here i'd been here in about seven years in, in the philly area with governed by the east penn rugby union i became the college director I saw a real need to help the colleges because the, the, the East Penn Rugby Union was the second largest, second to NERFU in how many colleges. We had about 50 to 55 men and women's colleges. And at that time, you, you may recall, USA Rugby only had Division One playoffs, okay? And it was clear when I, when I got involved that we had, we had two divisions because we had too many teams could not compete with our Division One teams. And I saw a need to really start creating a division two championship for the colleges so i did that you know working at that time with nerfu which had a very b large number of colleges and a lot of teams in division two we created an east coast division two championship in 92 men and women and then in 97 i 
you know, was doing it again when I got contacted by a team from Texas, Stephen F. Austin University, wanting to come out to our sp to the spring event, and and I said, of course. So I added another team, so it would be a good balanced event. Uh, and I was I was good friends with Ed Haggerty, as everyone knows from from uh, Rugby Magazine, and, and and talking with Ed, and I told him about this, and he said, hey, make it a national championship, and which which I did. I called the National Invitation Championship. It went extremely well. It was won by Salisbury over Stephen S. Austin in the, in the final. And I turned to the committee and I said, listen, I've been doing all this stuff for five years with Division II. Why not build the Division II playoffs of USA Rugby? And they thought it was a great idea. I took, took that to the board of directors. They approved it. 98 USA Rugby st started it. So part of that work I did on the committee was to get Division USA Rugby to take over to, you know, Division II you know, colleges and create a playoff system. And, and and did that lead then to the formation of national small college rugby organization and SCRO? Yeah, it, it, it did because by 2002, my work with the colleges it became pretty pretty obvious that they were actually, especially in in, in both in Nerfu and and in um, throughout this your the big territory called USA Rugby South as well as East Penn uh, and, and this all at Mid Atlantic area, we had three levels of college competition, and I learned you know, from the years I was working with colleges, the most important thing, and even to this day, really, the colleges want, they want to play competitively, you know, competitive league. It's more important to them than, than being the big dog, you know, in a weak conference and just winning it. Because when, as you all know, and, and all listeners know, is that if you're beating everybody by 40, 50 points, and then you go into a higher level competition in a playoff system, you're not, you're not prepared. And you know, and the chances of success are, are not are not very high. So I started helping to create that, that various levels, and started creating a Division Three level, and it became a sort of a pecking order. And my goal, you know, and in, in starting as this East Coast thing thing was, which was really to help the D the D three teams find, get out of the comfort zone, play other teams, learn you know learn learn team building skills from traveling. And then, and then I realized that by 2007, working with Chip Oskevich from uh, Nerfu, is we started, you know, talking to people around the country and found the need to create a national organization, you know, for the D3 schools, which were primarily small colleges, and it was really, you know, uh, so, so that's really how Enscrow began. But bear, also bear in mind is before I even even consider making a national organization. I talked to USA Rugby, the people there, and said, hey, this is what I'd like to do. And they said, please, you know, that they had that their interest was division one and two. Division three was all mine. So that's how Insgro started. And it's had extreme growth pain, or not pains really, but just a huge growth uh, rate the last <laughs> the last uh, 10 years or so, right? Tell us about that growth. Yeah, the, the, the growth was, was was pretty interesting, you know, and, and and to be real frank, my, my goal with Enscro was to help Division Three teams. First of all, all the teams that were part of Enscro paid me a, a small fee through their union, you know, so I could I could I could pay for fields, pay for medical, pay for referees, etc. Um, myself, I never 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 took a penny. Spent a lot of money out of my own pocket to do so, which I was fortunately able to do. But wound up, um, you know, helping them to get better. And, and, and help them to advance because they all had to be members of USA Rugby, pay the dues there, and help them to go to D2 and D1. And and as I started doing things, and I do things, you know, again, the three most important things in, run, in, in running an event itself is that teams come to is a quality field, quality referees, and, 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 and proper medical care. You know, and that's those things I really put a lot of emphasis on. And, and fortunately, I was very well connected with a lot of people in the referee, you know, the U.S. referee community. I was able to get good referees, get good, good venues and everything. And that helped and you know, you know, become, become successful. And teams start, started each year, especially on the men's side, started getting better. And they, and they started going to D2. Some went to D1. But interestingly, um, they, a lot of them came back. They found that what I was doing was better you know, than the other guys, the, the, the other organization. And they, and so I, every year I can show you my the growth chart. I could lose 20 teams, but I gained 30, 40. So I kept, I kept on growing. 
and you know, and and you know, sort of, sort of the, you know, the rest was history. But it did present a unique challenge for Enstro because we were getting a little top heavy in some areas with teams, frankly, did not belong at the D three level. They, they 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 were too good, yeah. you know. And well, in early twenty twenty, Enstro reformed as the National Collegiate Rugby Organization (NCR) to serve all colleges, and currently it serves nearly six hundred men's and women's college teams. Uh, tell us a little bit about that transformation. Yeah, that that transformation was was not planned, and frankly, what was uh, I, I may use the word by by accident um, is that in the summer of 2019, Enscro was evolving, and I had, we had become a nonprofit five four years earlier. I had a board of directors. I also had said that I needed to step back. I needed needed people, you know. I was doing three major roles, and I need they needed to really bring in higher people because it became very clear. And I think most of the listeners will recognize this: the rugby organizations for too long re, re, revolved around volunteers only, unpaid volunteers. And and I hate to use the term. In most cases, you get what you pay for. If you pay nothing, sometimes you get nothing. You can't hold people accountable. And so I said, we 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 need to basically bring in people, look for funding, better sources of funding. Thankfully in 2015, I was able to sign a very good deal with Penn Mutual Life Insurance Company. They wanted to get involved in college rugby and, and they came to Enscro as the first place to, to get that going. And their funding helped me hire a marketing person and helped me hire Brent Shivers as a women's director, help build the, uh, the women's side of Enscro, you know, and so, um, that was, you know, you know, really be, became a very important part part of our growth. Okay. You know, so so NCR, as yes, NCR. So it's summer 2019, we did strategic planning, professional strategic planning to grow NSCRO because the most of big schools, big school rugby was sort of still to this day sort of tapped out in terms of you know most of them have rugby, you know, whereas there are thousand thousand plus small colleges that do not. So we wanted to do more for small, grow small college rugby, and we were all planning to do it throughout the fall. We were we were t talking to USA Rugby about increased funding, and you know, um, and you know, to help to help 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 us do that because again, we were trying to serve members of of, of USA Rugby, and as most I think everybody knows, what happened late fall of 2019, USA Rugby's financial problems became you know you know bubbled up to the top and led to their you know, re reorganization and and in early 2020 we had a group of uh was men's division two colleges contact us and wanted to see if we would consider them you know as as members and part of the challenge there was a third of them were large schools our board of directors we talked to that we talked to their leadership of this group and our board of directors made the decision that we would rebrand to bring in this division two men's colleges as you know uh, under the new organization you know of, of ncr and that's and, and that and that's and, and, and that's and that's sort of how how it started we also went out and and we were directed by usa rugby during the reorganization to go get our own insurance go get our own registration take care of our members because they they frankly didn't know in early 2020 what was going to happen whether they were going to be around in six months so we went ahead and, and took care of that at their direction and um and then as we started doing that we were we, we were reached out by more to some division one programs men and women and we started growing and you know and, and ncr is now you know the, the leading rugby organization college rugby organization in the country thanks to thanks to uh, a tremendous staff we have now uh, steve your career in rugby spanned over 50 years what are some of your accomplishments that have had that a lasting effect? Um, there are there, there are a number of things I would say. Um, you know the the I think the, the, a lot of a lot of it deals with I guess rugby safety really making that important. You know I I used to, one of the things that I used to harp on with with teams and with, with groups is the importance of a certified athletic trainers being present at at all rugby matches. Where I had I remember when our, in East Penn Rugby Union we had a lot of high school. We were 40 50 high school programs, you know, uh, back then 
and um, now I became also president, vice president, and then president of the union. And they they and they, fit, they would have an ambulance at, at at the match, and they thought that was sufficient. And I and as I learned about the difference between the care an EMT can give and the care of a certified athletic trainer, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I said, listen, ninety five percent of your injuries require a certified athletic trainer to properly evaluate and, and generally get a player back maybe within a few minutes back back into the game and make sure they get the proper care. That's not what the EMT and ambulance done. And I wasn't lowering the importance of having that there, but I just said that there's a need to have certified athletic trainers. And that started really taking off. And I, that's one of the things um I, one of my to me, one of my uh, you know, you know, greatest accomplishments. The other thing is how how my work has really inspired others. And you know, and it, and it was I, and and it's interesting in rugby. And I think you probably know this, Brian, is and, and others, is that you know you have you make these friends throughout rugby and stuff, and you do things. They see what you do, but really, do they ever really, you know, you really ever find out, you know, what it what it means what it means to them? And thankfully, thanks to my election to the Hall of Fame, I was able to when I I put it up on social media and became out there. I got hundreds of. Uh, no uh, messages, whether it was on Facebook, um, phone calls, emails, from people saying well deserved. But more importantly, a lot of them were telling me how what I did helped inspire them to for them to do to do to do more, and you know, and and and, and give their all, so to speak. Is that what you're most proud of, then? Yeah, I, 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 you know, absolutely. I, you know, in terms of rugby. In terms of life is ha having a, a, wonder, a wonderful, a wonderful wife, and you know, and and and, and, and great friends. Always key, yeah. Steve, what is one piece of piece of advice you could give to an uh, aspiring rugby administrator or referee, for that matter? Um, I was, I've, I've been rethinking about that, and it, you know, it's I, and I would say, trying to bring it down to almost just one, I say it's it's really important to rec recognize. And understand the differences between the wants and the needs of of, of your me the members you serve, okay, and 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 understanding and listening to them, okay, so, so you know, you know, and a lot of things is, is things they would they'd like to happen, but there's certain things that they 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 really need, you know, that 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 will best serve that will best serve best serve them, and I think that that providing and listening to that and and then and, and providing that service. What, what I what I call it a high degree of responsiveness. Okay, in other words, you know, is you, someone calls you and and, you, and you're not available to leave your message. Don't wait two weeks to call them back. Call them back as as soon as you can. You may have to, twenty phone calls to call back, but make the make the make those calls as as soon as possible. Be be respon responsive because too much in rugby people tell me they there was too much lack of responsiveness, and so. I, that's something that I, I put a high degree of uh, importance on. Okay. And Steve, what does it mean being selected to the U.S. Rugby Hall of Fame? Uh, it means it, it, it means the world. I mean, it, you, know, you know, naturally, it's 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 a, it's an honor unto itself. But 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 seeing you know the Hall of Fame over the years and and who's and who's been elected to it is primarily as you know been been players and coaches. Okay, being elected. Be, you know, not because of my stellar playing career and and my, my almost zero coaching career, and, and recognizing the accomplishments I, I I've done in, in other areas, whether it's you know whether it was uh, safety, whether it was refereeing, or my my, my early work with we, we helping develop helping support women's rugby, you know, really is is you know just just you know just extremely satisfying but it's but it's also it also really connects all the dots and show, you know and it really can help show that you know that that people have really val valued you know what what i've done and e and even people who, who who a lot of people who didn't really know and it's, so it's good to see that what i've done being exposed so hopefully encourage others you know to do so like an ncr we have we have this expression we, we call keep the boots on it's 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 our goal to help college players when they graduate keep the boots on, what, which means stay involved in rugby whether you do so as a player, coach, referee, administrator, or even just a fan. Mm -hmm. Well, you certainly kept your boots on for over fifty years in the rugby community. We thank you for all you've done for the game, and uh, congratulations on your well-deserved honor. And thank you for being here today. 
Yeah, yeah, my, my pleasure. And, th and thank you for all you're doing. All right, folks, that's going to do it for today's podcast. Uh, we'll have more with you podcasts in the near future, especially with all of our Hall of Famers and special award recipients. If you want to learn more about the U.S. Rugby Foundation, go to our homepage at usrugbyfoundation.org. If you want to learn more about the Hall of Fame, go to usrugbyfoundation.org slash Hall of Fame. Until next time, everyone, stay safe.